All right. Uh, well, thank you all for joining us uh, here at day two of FC Build. Uh, we had just under a thousand attendees yesterday, and today is shaping up to be even bigger. So for the next 45 minutes, we're going to dig into the wonderful world of uh, deep learning, artificial intelligence, and limitless possibilities. Um, I'll start with some introductions. So my two guests uh, this morning are Serena Young and Andrew Feldman. Uh, Serena is an assistant professor of biomedical data science, computer science, and electrical engineering at Stanford. Uh, her research interests are in the areas of computer vision, machine learning, and deep learning with a particular focus on applications uh, to healthcare. Serena earned her PhD at uh, Stanford under Fei-Fei Li and Arnold Milstein, after which she was a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, and in addition to these extraordinary academic bona fides, uh, Serena has also spent time at Facebook AI Research and Google Cloud AI. Now for Andrew's background, hard to follow. Don't Serena, even huh? bother after that background. I mean, that's, no, no, really. I, I'm the one my mother introduced. This is my son who's not a doctor. I mean, so just, exactly. just stop. Andrew's the only non-doctor in his in his in his family. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't take that too seriously. But uh, he did grow up on Stanford campus uh, and is even known to chase down tennis balls uh, hit by Nobel laureates as a kid. Uh, no, in all, all seriousness, uh, Andrew is co-founder and CEO of Cerebra Systems, which he founded actually um, uh, in our Menlo Park Park office in the spring of 2016. Uh, prior to this, Andrew was co-founder and CEO of C Micro, uh, which is where I actually first met him a few years before the company was taken out by AMD. Before that, Andrew was VP of marketing at two seminal networking companies, Force 10 Networks and Riverstone Networks uh, from inception through IPO. So thank you uh, both for joining us. I want to kick things off um, with a quick look back on the last six to seven years of deep learning and artificial intelligence and ask you, Andrew, to share just a bit about uh, the AI workload growth that we've witnessed over the last uh, handful of years. I think we've, thanks, Steve. And uh, thank you guys for, for joining us today. I, I think the last six or eight years has seen sort of AI and deep learning workload emerge as the most important workload of our generation. And it's grown uh, in demand unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, there's a, a, a nifty blog post by the guys at OpenAI and, and they show the amount of compute needed to work on a large workload between 2013 and, and today. And it's increased order 25,000 X a year. I mean, it, it, this is sort of mind boggling growth. Uh, you know, we used to think in our business that Moore's law at doubling every 18 months was a big deal. Uh, th this is tens of thousands of times faster than that. The work that we, we thought was large in, in 2013 or 14 is trivial and unimportant today. And so uh, we, we've been at sort of ground zero of this extraordinary explosion of demand for compute. The neural networks have gotten larger. Uh, we've had now models that have a trillion parameters and, and we have customers and partners looking to, to build 25 trillion parameter models. And those were beyond imagining even a handful of years ago. And so as computer builders, which is what we are at Cerebris, building computers dedicated to AI, this is, these are the salad days. And, and so uh, it's a great time. Very cool. Now, Serena, um, if you kind of think about the applications that have been fueling this uh, 300X growth that Andrew outlined, um, we all know that you know, companies like Google are trying to win games of Go. Uh, or tell the difference between uh, a picture of a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. But like, what are the actual things that the applications that, you know, are maybe powering the things we do day to day, but people aren't just paying attention to where ML is really taking hold? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that we're at this really exciting point right now where there is a good amount of AI technology that is essentially mature and that's, you know, sort of ready to be able to be deployed and and uh, sort of used everywhere. And, you know, I think it's really um, uh, in almost everything you can you can think about now from, you know, whether it's a it's a mobile app helping with uh, sort of personalization, personalized recommendations, um, whether it's uh, various kinds of um, you know, sort of recognition, search and recognition applications, um, whether it's helping 
uh, you know, sort of businesses manage things. You know, I'm, I'll think of just, you know, hospitals as an example, everything from, uh, you know, patient intake to uh, patient care management to helping, you know, sort of prediction and um, decision making right, for, for very specialized uh you know, specialized expertise and, and needs um, to, you know, sort of post-care uh, management. So really, I think, um, you know, everywhere we're sort of at this stage where especially problems that you can formulate in a supervised learning way where you are able to have labeled data, you are able to uh, train, you know, uh, models to be able to, uh, to predict these outputs um, that uh, at this point, it's really more about how can we effectively integrate these technologies in a way that is uh, beneficial to the user, right? That it is, a, you know, a seamless experience, um, that it is actually, you know, aligned with what users want and need, uh, that, you know, considers things like where an AI system may be imperfect, uh, which is you know, inevitably the case, even if it's extremely good, uh, how do you handle these sorts of um, these sorts of uh, you know Im imperfections. How do you look at where where humans are good at, where AI uh, algorithms are good at? So, um, so I, I think that we're really you know just now at this stage where it's just about uh, where we can do you know so uh, there's there's a large amount that I think it's it's more about how can we integrate these technologies into uh, products and use cases. Got it. So it's, it's a, another, oh, go ahead. Way, another way you might think about it is you know my. My 88-year-old mother-in-law asks Alexa to play Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And okay. um, without getting up. And Alexa delivers a, a collection of Frank Sinatra songs. And sometimes she couldn't remember that she liked that song. Right. A and uh, what, what, what a nice thing that is to see. A and so there's a, an instance of it impacting not the, the, the rapid ad adoption edge of the curve, but the, the trailing edge and making making her happy. And, and that's sort of a, a lovely thing to see from the most innovative applications that Serena just mentioned to to those who are least technically savvy. Right, right. And I think one of the points to use your grandmother, I think such a great example uh, that I would add to this is for it to be usable to your grandmother, it has to be good, like 95% good, not 75% good. Uh, you know, I think about, um, you know, maybe your grandmother driving as opposed to ask for Frank, Frank Sinatra. It's like mobilize uh, pedestrian recognition algorithms are about 50% accurate right now, which is, which means about one of every two pedestrians dies when, you know, when you've got a self-driving car powered by that system. Now, uh, you know, we've, we've slowly gained purchase on, uh, on image recognition, on speech recognition. You know, but it's like a percent every two years. Um, but that's that percent is just incredibly valuable from the user experience and to your point, Serena, to the applications. Can you kind of give us a sense as and maybe this is a good segue, Andrew, into kind of what Cerebrus is building is as you're fighting for every percent of uh, of accuracy on these systems, like how hard is that really to kind of get a little bit better, uh, Serena, with you know, image recognition, a little bit more accurate so it, you know, it's not Sinatra, but you know, you know, you know, Michael Jackson didn't pop up instead. Um, tell us a little bit about that challenge of gaining purchase on the on the accuracy problem. Yeah, so I think it's a combination of you know every time we see significant either uh, models, so architectural, for example, or uh, or hardware advances, these you know typically can give us a, a pretty uh, significant jump. And then beyond that, I think there's also the second aspect, uh, which is you know getting increasingly uh, important, which is also for any given now, you know, let's say model and, and hardware configuration, uh, all of these sort of engineering involved, right? That's data engineering. That's you know uh, how you're you're training these models. It's all of the the details now. That's really part of the um, the art of of machine learning. So I think it's uh, it's really all of these together. And you know, I would say that if we think about the kinds of tasks that uh, we're both able to do and, and trying to target in machine learning, you know, things like uh, things like classification, uh, you know, that you're mentioning visual recognition, these should be getting, you know, for the most part, if you're able to get sort of enough data, uh, enough label data, you're able to, uh, you know, to effectively uh, practice this art of machine learning, you should be able to get uh, quite good. I think things like detection and segmentation as we're getting into sort of richer and richer uh, sorts of tasks, I'm using sort of computer vision as a, um, as as sort of the the uh, example here, um, but as we're we're getting here, uh, you know, we're we're getting quite good. We're getting in in place. Where, you know, we're able to deploy these sorts of algorithms. Um, but I think there is still room to go, and I think more uh, coming from you know, I think future uh, 
sort of uh, t technological, you know, methods, innovations to come. Um, and so that's getting us to very kind of fine grained, uh, fine grained sort of perception, right, of uh, yep. you know, machine learning perception. Um, and then, in, in, you know, and then I think that as you get to sort of what are relatively more unsolved problems, whether that's in uh, reinforcement learning, heading towards uh, unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning, looking yep. at, um, you know, even even more uh, uh, to, you know, interactive learning, continual learning. So, so as we get further and further into these different paradigms of learning, I think these are now very much um, unsolved problems where, you know, we, we would expect that, you uh, uh, there, there will be innovations coming up in the future that will give big leaps, right? Because there is still um, significant room to go in these. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to roll back to 2015, Andrew. You're in the office of the CTO at AMD. Uh, you're thinking about uh, you know, what you might be doing next. You're seeing this you know, explosive growth uh, of, of, of AI workloads in the data center. Um, and then you're, you decide, I'm going to throw myself and you know, an amazing team at this problem in a really big way. Tell us what Cerebrus is building, why it's so different from a CPU or a GPU with none of the touchstones of traditional computing. Um, you know, wh what, it, what is it that you guys are building and why is it so interesting? Well, I, I think what we're building is, uh, and what we've, what we've now built is the, the, the fastest AI processing machine. And we, we saw that uh, this was a, a workload with explosive growth. And we saw that uh, the existing compute infrastructure was a poor fit for this work. And for those of us who, who, who'd been around uh, a long time in the industry, we, we'd seen this, this movie before where there emerges a workload. And in the, the mid nineties, it was uh, IP switching. And in 2007 and 2008, it was uh, cell phone, low power compute. And when a workload emerges that is poorly suited for the existing infrastructure, and when that workload is on an exponential growth, it creates opportunity for people to build better machines. And historically, that inflection point has produced new large companies and threatened the existing status quo, right? The companies that nobody remembers that were around in 1996, like Nortel Networks, 3Com, uh, Cabletron, um, Bay Networks, Synopsis, they dominated the landscape prior to 2006, 2000. Digital. By 2000, uh, 96 or 98, by 2003, they're all dead. And out of that emerged sort of a small number of extraordinarily large and successful companies, Cisco, Juniper, Arista. The same thing happened in, uh, in the uh, cell phone workload. Uh, there were existing companies like Intel, like Nvidia, like AMD, who got exactly zero share, right? They were all extraordinarily well positioned. They had the fab relationships. Some of them owned fabs. They had the, 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 the best right. computer architects and all failed at that problem. And so when you see an opportunity where you've got a huge workload that is poorly met by existing, uh, by existing solutions, it is the opportunity, it is the spark. And so we, we studied this workload, we understood what it asked for. And this workload is, is very unusual in that in AI, because it's a network, you can think about it as a feedback loop. There's a little bit of calculation and you move the results and a little bit of calculation and you move the results. And from a compute perspective, the moving of information is enormously hard. And uh, we, we came up with an idea that, that we could build a much larger chip that would produce uh, orders of magnitude faster performance. And so just to understand the scope, this sad little chip here, size of a postage stamp. This is the largest chip prior to us. Um, and, and it's sort of, sort of, <laughs> well, 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 this is us, right? So, you know, th this little You're trying to make it look us. smaller because it's in such and a big what case. What we were here. able to do by putting all these cores, 400,000 cores, by putting huge amounts of memory and memory bandwidth, 
is build a computational foundation that was optimized in every way for this work. And that gives us two, three orders of magnitude performance improvement. And when you have that as a foundation, researchers like Serena and her peers and colleagues and those in industry, then they get a chance to test different algorithms, different approaches. It reduces the amount of time it takes for them to innovate. It reduces the sort of cost of curiosity. Instead of waiting weeks or months to get a result, you might do it over coffee. And so they can test yep. many, many ideas and they can drive forward the, 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 the accuracy of the models. They can create new and different models that are specialized at different types of problems. And you can even create models that knowingly take advantage of some of the underlying compute capabilities. And that's how our industry is moving forward. And I think what... Yeah, this, uh, this, this cost of curiosity is such a good point. And I wanted to segue it back to you, Serena, and maybe also you could weave in, uh, there's a question from Jason Baumgarten, which is in, you know, in your view, how can smaller companies or teams that are not focused on AI and ML um, benefit from this? You know, is this a King's game or can little companies? And I have some thoughts on this as well, but you know, just the fact that I know your, your students uh, and research is where a lot of the most interesting stuff is happening, I think, the beloved NeurIPS conference is happening this week as well. Um, but yeah, how, yeah, so would, I think, um, you know, first how would you think about this sort of make a quick question around on, uh, sort of is this you know, just, Andrew just was, for was big saying companies in terms of and, the huge and, and research universities and things in, in like that? Machine learning. And I think that, you know, certainly like the, the kind of, you know, hardware that uh, Cerebrus is building is um, incredible for, even you know, current workloads and supervised uh well, the dominant paradigms of supervised learning. But I think that if you look ahead to where kind of the next big, I mean, you know, the next huge steps in AI are going to be, you know, for example, being able to uh, move more towards, uh, you know, unsupervised learning and other types of paradigms where for the most part, um, you know, we might not have the same, uh, the, the learning might not be as efficient, right, in, in some sense, because we're not giving it a precise task and uh, guiding it to perform exactly this task, but are instead asking it to sort of ingest and learn broadly from, you know, large amounts of experience. I think, you know, what's really exciting to me is just how much even more so, you know, some of these kinds of um, uh, hardware advancements might really, you know, power that <laughs> that that future of AI. So I think it was just, that was just something that really excited me uh, also, you know, hearing what Andrew was was just talking about. Is, is that where is that where your students are most excited? I mean, I think unsupervised learning is such an interesting kind of less explored because you know there's so much value being created in the supervised domain, and there's you know the applications and the use cases as you were talking about earlier, all quite clear whether it's asking Alexa or you know recognizing <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, images. That, that is one of the areas of research um, are your students that we're most excited, excited about the kind of uns because, unsupervised you know, domain. We're now trying to go from going uh, us teaching the AI to perform as certain tasks to trying to get to a paradigm where the you know AI algorithms can. Uh, teach us new things, right? That can give us whether it's uh, sort of new new insights, uh, being able to process, you know, large amounts of of data. Um, in our case, in particular, sort of new insights about you know sort of biomedicine and, and healthcare that can be used also to uh, you know improve care for patients. So um, yeah, so I think that's that's certainly one of the directions uh, we're really excited about. Um, and then I know right, this is just a, you know a comment I wanted to make, but before going to the uh, the other question that. Um, you know, in, in terms of, I think this is the audience question, um, for, uh, you know, in terms of s smaller companies uh, who are not focused on the uh, AI and ML tech, uh, no, I, I think, I think certainly um, they can, uh, there's a lot that small companies uh, can do now without having to be those, huge, you know, kings that are, that are training, you know, gigantic models, having, you know, burning tons and tons of uh, uh, dollars in uh, sort of, uh, you know, huge model development. Um, I think this actually goes back to the, the comment I think I was making earlier where uh, right now, I think it's just a really big open field where, you know, the advancements in these recent advancements in AI that we've been talking about, even in supervised learning are still all, you know, recent enough and with new capabilities coming uh, every day that um, you can imagine that huge space of potential, uh, uh, you know, application areas that I think we're, you know, really only scratching the surface of. And, and so I think a lot of it is, uh, uh, really more about um, how can we effectively utilize these uh, th these algorithms? How can we uh, effectively integrate it into 
in, into products. And I, and I think that, you know, a lot of that is not even, it's not even necessarily thinking about AI methods development, but it's about how do you effectively utilize and and leverage uh, leverage this, this AI. Um, I think, you know, one thing it makes me think about is, especially with the, the COVID pandemic, I think one of the really interesting uh, phenomenon that's ha that's happened, especially in healthcare, is you know, sort of the move of everything to um, virtual visits. I mean, to remote uh, telehealth, right? And, and this is a really uh, you know huge paradigm shift in in healthcare. And uh, you know now I, I I you know see many uh, I think many many groups and and people thinking about um, uh, you know about how do we develop uh, you know tools in, in telehealth utilizing AI in, in telehealth and for the most part you know many of them uh, have at least people you know talk to have I mean there's kind of similar sorts of AI technologies that you could imagine being integrated into here but where I think is a big unsolved question that I think will determine the success or not of many of these companies is how do you actually integrate it and what's the actual user experience uh, from here which I think is a there's a big variance uh, and I think you know that's exactly um, Mm. A big unknown space. Yep. Andrew, you uh, you lived through uh, the crazy growth of the internet days. You're talking about networking and explosion in the 90s. And, you know, I'm reminded, I mean, the NURPS uh, conference is such a great uh, way to experience this. And I always love nerding out on the talks and workshops there, if it, if it only didn't overlap with our conference here. But, um, you know, the... Uh, the thing that's so striking to me is how quickly everything is changing, right? There are new frameworks we weren't even talking about six months ago that are becoming the most popular things. Um, you know, it really does remind me of, you know, th those early days of, of the internet when things were improving and evolving so quickly uh, that entire frameworks, you know, might've come and gone in a year's period. Um, is that your experience I, I as well? That, that's and the best time. Uh, and how, how do you kind I, I of build the, a company the worst knowing time that to, to things are changing literally under your feet? W w when in extremely mature markets where nothing's changed. I mean, there are not a lot of startups in oil and gas or in mining or, or in industries that have very long histories and are unchanged. I think the best time to build a company is when there's tremendous foment, when there's huge interest when uh, small teams with big ideas have an opportunity to uh, make a tremendous impact. And I, I, I think this, uh, one of your one attendees, John, asked this question about deeper networks. Um, I, I think, uh, it, John, we, we agree completely. I, I think one of the things that's interesting in this foment is there are lots of different approaches. Uh, you don't have to build deeper networks to increase accuracy. Maybe really shallow, extremely wide networks are the way to go, but we haven't been able to try them. And so now with equipment like ours, you can. And all of us are, are working in, in both uh, sort of the hardware and system business, as well as the algorithm and the research in, in pushing this big ball forward and in creating, in our case, uh, uh, a foundation on, on which people can test their ideas, heretical ideas, traditional ideas, ideas that are, are uh, sort of impossible to test on existing infrastructure. And I, I think that's the funnest time to build companies, Steve, um, by, by far. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this cost of curiosity. My, my question was more around sort of the framework specifically, the software frameworks changing so quickly. I mean, uh, you know, getting yeah, what, what uh, the, all wrapped around one by the time you built around in, it, uh, in you know, the next, next most popular one is, is coming out you know, to from a paper from Toronto. Uh, where you're going to be specialized and where you're going to be general. Right. And uh, if you choose to be extremely specialized in a very narrow area and the market moves against you, uh, you you've made a mistake. And so I think the underpinnings of ML are in sparse linear algebra. Right, and that's tough. And whether you're doing uh, natural language processing or whether you're doing convolutional neural networks for vision work like, like Serena does or, or other, the calculations when they come down to the compute level are, are sparse linear algebra. And so that's what you wanna be good at. And as you build up from there, uh, you have to be ready and anticipate change. 
right? You, you have to be ready for, for PyTorch. You have to be ready for, uh, for, for TensorFlow, but also yeah. when we so were building company, something, there was no BERT. And BERT is a tremendous model right now. And we're the fastest in the industry by, by an order of magnitude or two at it. And when we right. designed the compute architecture, the model didn't exist. Transformers didn't exist. And we had to design something that was sufficiently flexible that it could anticipate changes in the industry. It could anticipate by understanding what those innovations would build on and being good at the foundational elements. Yep, yep. So we're gonna spend um, a chunk of time uh, talking about sort of the where this is all going and I'm super excited about that. Before we do that, um, Serena, I'd love to get your thoughts. So it's, you know, it's absolutely clear to me and most folks in the industry that there's still more work to be done, particularly around uh, bias, explainability, lots of unintended consequences. Um, you earned your PhD under Feifei, uh, who also cares deeply about these issues. It's what she's kind of working, working on almost exclusively now. Yeah, Can you so just give us I, kind I of a sense really for where we are today, so I'm glad you how are we up, doing, and, and where are the know, biggest gaps say, on this issue? Uh, we're essentially, you know, doing horribly <laughs> right now. We're, we're kind of at the, just at the very, very beginnings of sort of as a field, uh, you know, having awareness that there, there, there is these issues and that, that we need to tackle them now and they're not something that can be, you know, sort of pushed off later. And I think, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that hopefully will help uh, sort of enforce that is the fact that, you know, we do now need to be thinking about, it's, it's again going back to that bridging the gap from we've started to see huge amounts of potential for these AI algorithms. We're starting to see the first set of, you know, uh, of, of AI uh, deployed in, in products, but as we seek to extend, extend these and increase sort of the interaction that AI has with, uh, with people and, and affecting people, then, you know, these issues become uh, absolutely critical, uh, making sure that, you know, for, for, for algorithms uh, that they're being used, you know, what's, um, how do they perform for different groups? What's the, what's also the consequences, right? Depending on the applications, you can have, you know, maybe some, sometimes the consequences are not so bad. Sometimes the consequences can be um, really, uh, really dr dr drastic and, and terrible. Uh, if you've got, um, you know, for example, the, the famous example of uh, face recognition, right? Technology that is, you know, what, uh, some commercial systems were audited and, and shown to perform much more per, uh, poorly for uh, darker skinned uh, individuals right. and, in, and darker skinned females in, in particular. So all of these things have, um, have huge consequences. And so I think where we are right now as a field is having some of that first awareness that Oh, that these problems are there, and that they uh, they matter, and they're already starting to matter when we're trying to deploy these. Uh, and so, you know, I think we need a lot of uh, the the you know uh, we need both solutions to to try and fix this in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, the bias. But one major uh, challenge is also it's hard for us to be able to. Uh, understand and interpret exactly what these deep learning algorithms are doing to be, you know, even able to start understanding some of what's going on and how to address this. So I think that's another, you know, big area of, of ongoing research. I think, you know, you'll mm. hear a lot about in terms of it, uh, interpretability of models, explainability, um, and then how do we uh, uh, think about and, and utilize these notions to be able to actually uh, create, you know, sort of ethical, yeah. uh, ethical and fair products. Steve, whenever we talk about we talk about biases in, in computers, I, I think it's really helpful to to, to think that um, yep. you know, we've had hundreds of years and can't get rid of biases in people, <laughs> right? We 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 know that you know what did Tversky say? And in, in when asked if he studied AI, he said, "I'm not interested in artificial intelligence. I'm interested in human stupidity." And we know that, that humans are biased, that, that uh, humans have a great deal of trouble in cross-racial identification, that these biases are, are not sort of different in compute. There are biases that, that we have every day in every human. Um, and, and the other observation is I have more faith that we'll fix them in algorithms than we'll fix them in people. Right. We've had hundreds of years of failing to change, right, our, our human biases. And when we can see them in mathematics, we can fix them very quickly. 
And so while we're not good at it yet, there's a tr right. huge amount of hope, I think, that as we, that, that within a re yeah, relatively a question... short period of time, 8, 10, 15 years, we will be able to get our arms around this problem in our algorithms in a way we've never been able to get it around as a society. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting point. I think the the only sort of pushback I'd have is, you know, if, if sort of the analogy is, uh, you know, we're, you know, we are as humans biased, you know, if, if, if you had the scale issue, uh, meaning like, you know, if, if my model is basically a really hard working third grader, but I have billions of them working really hard. I mean, uh, we announced, uh, you announced a couple weeks ago, um, some really interesting CFD models that are now running faster than real time. And as I read that, I was thinking to myself, I remember the, the first uh, uh, renderings that, you know, uh, that, that Pixar was working on, it would take them a day to render, to render a frame. And you're thinking, okay, so amazing. Now we're actually rendering effectively the same models of, you know, whatever the, 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 the bubbles and, uh, and uh, the ray tracing around Nemo um, faster than it would have happened in real life. Um, and so your point stands, but if you've got billions or trillions of these, uh, you know, really hardworking fourth graders <laughs> that are biased or bringing their own um, perspectives to this, and we haven't uh, been able to correct for it, that's, that's, I think, what people are worried about. But I think I'm actually much more optimistic. I'm where you are in terms of I think we will. I think we'll be able to design this stuff out. The explainability is where we have to kind of prove that we're doing it, and also the sizes of the models. The fact that we won't have to throw away data when we're training them. We'll actually welcome more data, um, so that you know you're not you're not taking uh, the images of computer science professors between sure. you know the years of nineteen sixty yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree and with that. And patterning I think, them off uh, that, as to Andrew's point, like I think one of the nice things about be, machine learning um, models is you know, going the fact so, that you know we are able you, to actually probe it and to uh, quantify the, you know and to try to measure uh, some of these things um, in a you know uh, in an extensive way, uh, which you know uh, I think gives a lot of interesting room for for trying to study these 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 questions. Um, but yeah, but exactly. I think there's a you know the the big danger, right? Why we have to worry about these things now is is because you know the the potential to through scale increase you know huge amounts of uh, disparities. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. Um, so I want to shift to the last part of our conversation. I also, just welcome uh, other folks to ask uh, questions over in the in the chat on the right. Um, and, and this last part is sort of for me the most fun uh, for, for for to kind of get your perspective. So I think back on Carver Mead was the you know physicist and one of the fathers of neuromorphic computing had this uh, you know kind of call to action back in 1980 and you know he was working on this concept around neurobiological architectures of the brain and he said you know to engineers he's basically like I want you to waste transistors uh, and that just seemed like a completely crazy idea at the time. Um, because at that time, you know, when you were writing code, it was the tightest, most efficient, you know, smallest footprint possible, to, you know, to get, basically get the most out of these scarce resources. Um, but of course, as you know, the computing resources became more, uh, you know, more, uh, more performant and, and more abundant with, with Moore's Law, as you outlined, Andrew, we could begin to kind of waste transistors. We could do things with graphical user interfaces, which of course, you know, then enabled the personal computer and the smartphone. Um, and and so this notion of you know wasting transistors or memory or storage or bandwidth or in our case maybe it's layers or parameters, um, you know what are some of the things that you guys are most excited about when we kind of put this model or this sort of challenge to kind of shift our mindsets away from scarcity of like it's going to take months to train that model and shift towards a mindset of abundance. Uh, and you know your cost of curiosity I point. I think Andrew ties to this, but you know, what are you guys most excited about when we kind of shift um, towards that abundance mindset? The there, there are whole classes of models that that people don't work on because they take too long. These include thing extremely sparse models. Uh, we don't do enough work on three D convolutions. Um, we don't do enough work on uh, striated or dilated convolutions. We the, the work that is really challenging gets set aside, even if it's important because it takes too long to train and nobody has the patience to train for a month or two months. It just, and so uh, 
you know, th th there's this huge open field of models that, that work poorly on GPUs, on the graphics processing engines that dominate the, the market today, and that we will be trying over the next 18 months on, on equipment like ours. And we, we hope that, that that sort of opens up this, this floodgate of, of improvements and drives up accuracy, allows new and different models to take shape. And, and maybe Serena can comment on this, but you know, what we've seen in the last several years for the first time was we moved away a little bit from the, the work that the fathers of the field did, the Bengios and the Hintons, and, and some new models emerged. You know, and, and I think we're, we want to accelerate that. We, we want to make it so that new model types can emerge that, that currently are, are sitting in, in theory papers because they take too long to prove out. Yeah, and just to, uh, to to add on to that, I totally agree with everything uh, Andrew is saying. And you know, if we think about new model types that might be coming mm -hmm. in the future, um, I think certainly you know, moving towards these these directions of of you know, first of all unsupervised learning that that we've been talking about, but even more so, I think that's a step in the in the direction of you know how can uh, we build AI algorithms that can truly perform reasoning, right? Abstract reasoning uh, that can, you know, sort of perform logical reasoning, all of these sorts of things, which are, I think, part of that um, sort of holy grail of AI that is really in, in that unsolved realm. And I think that as we think about trying to, to tackle these questions, I think there will be very fundamental uh, changes in, you know, uh, model structure neural networks is it neural networks also combined with other types of, you know, symbolic reasoning, uh, you know, uh, the, all of these ideas. And I would imagine that, you know, uh, as we go in these directions, that it might involve um, sort of different ways of manipulating, you know, sort of uh, manipulating data, manipulating um, sort of intermediate outputs of, of models, um, ways in which data is stored and then maybe re-referenced later, you know, everything that humans are doing now in terms of how how we actually perform sort of reasoning right how you might kind of read a book and really learn from it and encapsulate knowledge and be able to refer back to that knowledge all of that i think will be um have these you know sig and significant and probably not necessarily efficient uh sort of representations and, and paradigms and that's where you know potentially some of um that capacity that that increased capacity that we can get with these you know very large mm -hmm. hardwares could uh you know could enable some of that I'm so excited for that. I mean, you're sort of sneaking up on general AI and, and unsupervised learning, obviously, we talked about earlier, you're excited about. Um, Andrew, I'm going to give you a minute to think about quantum computing, which is a question from Victoria. And and while you're thinking about that, I was just going to pile on to the, you know, your response, uh, Serena, to, to Jason's question. And I'm thinking back on the due diligence that we did uh, before investing in, in Cerebras. And um, one of the companies um, uh, that, that we had a chance to talk to um, Stitch Fix, um, which I would put in the category at that time, they, they were not public yet, but you know, I put them in the smaller category, so not on the Google, Amazon web scale. And um, you know, this is a company that had at that time a team of 65 data scientists. They you know, were basically taking the onboarding um, uh, survey of, I think it was at that time, probably eight or nine pages um, of parameters. And, uh, and the whole goal was how can we increase the conversion efficiency of the items that you're receiving in the subscription commerce business model. And if they could get you to get one and a half more items uh, and not, you know, not return as many, it was a really big deal for them. And so I think uh, there's no question to me that this is going to be relevant to small and medium sized businesses. And the challenge for us, uh, and we, we are definitely cooking on it at Cerebras is how do we make um, resources like this uh, available as a service and you know if, if you think about the cost to train a model last february i think open ai said it was roughly it was somewhere between 50 and one hundred fifty thousand dollars to train a large-scale model now things have improved quite a bit since then but like if if that's what it costs and we can get that to 500 bucks yeah i i, I want bucks, to access to um, then Andrew. to me and we del deliver <laughs> it a service then we'll set that up, we'll set that up. <laughs> gas. so anyway andrew uh, I think, um, first, I'm serious, we should set up something with your lab and we can talk about that later. Oh, I'd love, love um, to. <laughs> Steve, to, to Jason's question, I, I think um, AI is one of the ways small companies can attack big companies. By being smarter with their data, by having better, whatever metrics are important to you, if they're logistics in, in days in transport, if they are 
a conversion. It's by using techniques that uh, uh, others aren't as sophisticated at or as good at or presents an opportunity to small companies. And, and you know, you've got some in the fintech sector that are using AI to, to evaluate loans, using AI to evaluate risk yep. in the insurance markets. All of these are ways for little companies to break into markets that have historically had a stronghold and where perhaps the, the, the incumbents are slow to move. Now, Victoria's question about quantum computing is really important. I, I think quantum computing is, is important for our society and it's not ready for prime time. And so it's something that we should continue to be investing in as a society. We, we should um, continue to do work there. But in terms of in the next five or seven years, it performing uh, sort of meaningful work in the artificial intelligence domain, uh, I'm not optimistic. I think in the long run, it will do much important work in, in the compute landscape. But we still have a, a lot of hard work to do uh, in the in the R part of R and D to, to to make it sort of usable and practical to to do sort of ordinary daily compute. Awesome. I um I have one more question, and then uh, we'll probably tag out. But um uh you know I'm I'm curious um. If we're at uh, uh, FC 2022 um, and you both are kind of looking back on, uh, you know, kind of the last two years of, of developments, um, we've talked about unsupervised. We've talked about sort of more interesting things happening in general AI, more use cases, uh, more connected with real um, consumers and, you know, business value. Um, what are kind of one or two well, other things that you think we'll, we'll be talking tenure, about maybe we'll people are paying close enough attention to today when it comes to deep learning and artificial intelligence? Tenure. For sure. <laughs> yeah, they, they might, they, they I can totally see that. <laughs> yeah. um, Andrew, you want an honorary PhD. You know, I, I think no. we will continue the only way you're to, get to it. see uh, AI infiltrate uh, our, our daily lives in ways we don't notice. And, and that uh, our emails will be filtered more intelligently. Our, it, it will be in the same way that, that you don't even realize how many computers you have in your house when you've you, you got one in your TV and you've got one in, right, you got one in your watch and you've got one in your cell phone and your iPad and you've actually got a computer and it, it sort of infiltrated our lives in, in ways we didn't sort of notice. And, you know, when, when you get in the car and you're, you're, you're using your Google Maps or you're using your mapping, yeah. your, uh, w w when it's, pro I mean, at, at every stage, it, it will sort of move into our lives and, and help make our lives better. It, and it will do so in, in hundreds of different little ways. In addition to. Yeah. Well, that. Yeah, I think. I think five years ago, people were thinking there's going to be an AI company. And I think what we've all realized is we're all going to be AI companies. And, and to your point, I think exactly, right. uh, you know, Serena, you said this as well. It's everywhere. I also think it's kind of like, remember the services days when there's a web services coming? No, web services is everywhere. <laughs> and so we just need to sort of assume that this is going to become sort of the oxygen and, and, and that applications and interfaces going forward are going to be as informed by the data as they are by the code, right? Like it used to be a set of code and rules that described a user interface. And now it's a hybrid of what is the code, but what's the data that makes this much interesting? What's what's the video I should be serving up to Andrew next that's more yeah, relevant um, to him than relevant uh, you know, to Serena? And, so, uh, and so this sort of marriage- One, of, one other of thing that I would data. also but, um, hope to see yeah, so in true. 2022 is- Anything, anything else to add, Serena? That we've made significant progress in, uh, in dealing with some of the unintended consequences of AI and uh, and I think that you know especially uh, if our goal is to to start to really you know realize that potential of AI mm -hmm. beyond kind of hype and initial uh, examples to really being pervasive. Uh, well, I think some of the biggest 
potential value of AI is to, you know, through that kind of democratization, actually help reduce disparities and help, uh, you know, increase access to all kinds of resources that, you know, would not have been possible without this kind of uh, machine assist, uh, assistance. Um, but if we're going to actually, you know, get there and to reduce disparities and not to increase them, then we need to be, I think, solving some of these problems that we need to have made progress in, you know, how we handle, um, these sorts of uh, imperfections in AI, both in, on the algorithm side, but I think also importantly in, in how do we take imperfect algorithms and uh, deploy them in products that are aware of and that consider all these issues. Um, and, you know, I think some of that, of course, also plays into uh, sort of more broader, you know, uh, I would, you know, uh, regulation and so, you know, around around the deployment of AI, which we're also in, in the infancy of. But I think that all of these different uh, aspects uh, around uh, sort of deploying AI safely and and fairly, I think, um, you know, are, are key to progress in, in actually, you know, realizing that that world of kind of uh, uh, pervasive, but, you know, helpful AI everywhere. What a great goal to end on. Uh, thank you, Serena. Thank you, Andrew, for joining us. We know you guys are crazy busy. Um, so really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and insights with, with the uh, guests here today. And I'll just remind uh, everyone, um, if you're joining the office hours, those start in, uh, I guess, 13 minutes, uh, partner office hours. And um, we'll look forward to, uh, to for seeing for you, Andrew and, and Serena Thanks, on another one of these down the line well, when, everyone. when uh, we've got even more fun stuff to point to and talk about. So thank you so much. Awesome. Bye. See you guys.